Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. Before we begin, I'd like to give a special shout out of thanks to some new members of our Patreon family. Kathy, Kate, Hillary, and Tony. Thank you all so much for supporting this podcast. By becoming members of Patreon, you help us remain 100% listener-supported and ad-free for everyone, and it's very much appreciated. And because you joined Patreon in the month of July, you and everyone else who supports us, either by joining Patreon or dropping us a one-time tip via buymeacoffee.com, will be entered into a special raffle at the end of the month, the prize for which is an exclusive episode made just for you. And because it's just for you, you can choose any book you like. Copyright restrictions do not apply. If you're interested in supporting us and having a chance in that giveaway, you'll find links to Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee in the show description. Good luck and thank you to everyone. Now, let's read and relax. Find a comfortable spot. Adjust your volume. Take a nice deep breath in. Let it out slowly. And off we go. Tonight we're reading a book with some relevance to a holiday in the United States this week that's rather well known for its fireworks displays. We're relaxing with Pyrotechnics, The History and Art of Firework Making by Alan St. Hill Brock, A-R-I-B-A, with numerous colored and other illustrations. First published in 1922 by Daniel O'Connor, 90 Great Russell Street, WC1, London. Let's begin. Introduction The word fireworks as a metaphor, used either to describe the higher flights of oratory, of literature, or of human strife, whether it be in Parliament or the Parish Hall, or merely descriptive of domestic discord, is familiar, even threadbare. Moreover, the metaphor has generally a humorous flavor. Why is this? Is there anything inherently comic about fireworks? It is true that for a short season, the less critical of the comic papers used the cracker and squib as pegs upon which to hang the type of joke which depends for its success on the atavistic human trait of laughing at the misfortune or discomfort of others. But this is the lowest type of humor, which soon palls upon the mind. The stage also has its comedy and clown, yet the mention of the stage is not a signal for mirth, can any who have heard the long-drawn ah of rapture from many thousand throats at the bursting of a flight of shell or the darting up of the wonderfully tinted rays of the magical illumination at the Crystal Palace maintain that the most dramatic moment on the stage is more affecting to the spectators? Pyrotechny is probably the only art which can compete with nature. Anyone who has seen a first-class firework display will admit that for impressive grandeur, color effects, and contrasts of light and shade, pyrotechny is unapproached. Pyrotechny paints on the canvas of the sky, and the results are at once the joy and despair of the artist. Many artists have tried to record their impressions, 
but the results have been generally disappointing. Whistler came near success, but even his wonderful work conveys merely the dying embers of past glory. One feels that here has been a magnificent display, but the scene in its full grandeur is not depicted. One of the few black and white artists who can approach the subject with some success is Mr. C. M. Pate, an example of whose work is reproduced in the following pages. His success comes from a careful study of the subject, both technically and from the point of view of composition. That fireworks are popular, there is no doubt. No form of amusement is capable of giving enjoyment to so many people at one time. There is no entertainment which so appeals to youth and age of all classes and tastes. And yet it is doubtful if there is an industry concerning which the public at large is so profoundly ignorant. To the average onlooker, any firework which rises in the air is a rocket. Any that revolve are Catherine wheels. Both of these assumptions are incorrect. What is the average conception of a firework factory? A building, let us say, in which workmen, with sleeves rolled up, are busily engaged in shoveling heaps of gunpowder. How many know that a firework factory consists of dozens of small buildings, the construction of which is exactly defined by law, separated by spaces also specified by law? that workmen may not roll up their sleeves in the danger buildings, or that the amount of gunpowder in each building is strictly limited to a small quantity. All of these restrictions being enforced with the view, of course, of limiting the effects of any explosion that may occur. So far as I am aware, no history of the art has yet been written, it is true that during the 19th century, many textbooks on pyrotechny were written, but the historical side of the subject has been generally represented by a few disjointed remarks in the prefaces. My object has not been to write a textbook on firework making, but rather to trace the art from earliest times and to give a description of the development and process of manufacture. For those interested in the subject and desiring fuller information, the list of manuscripts and books given in the bibliography at the end of this volume may be found useful. My excuse for adding another volume to the literature of the art is that I am of the eighth generation of a family of pyrotechnists, whose work I venture to claim has not been without its effect. If I succeed in interesting and in some degree enlightening my readers, I shall feel I have not written in vain. If I fail, I shall know it is not in my choice of subject, but in my capacity for dealing with it. Alan St. Hill Brock, Sutton, August 1922 Pyrotechnics the History and Art of Firework Making Part 1 Chapter 1 The Origin of Pyrotechny Pyrotechny, or the art of firework making, is of great antiquity, and the date of its origin is quite unknown. Indeed, it would be impossible to define with any degree of exactitude what actually constitutes a firework. It is curious how universal is the belief that fireworks were dependent upon the invention or discovery of gunpowder. Very little consideration will prove the fallacy of this view. In fact, will show that the reverse is probably the case. In India and China, saltpeter, or nitrate of potash, is found in large quantities, and was no doubt used by the primitive inhabitants in far-off times 
for such purposes as curing meat, cooking, etc. The dropping of a quantity in the campfire may have attracted the attention of some early inventor to the extent of starting him on a series of what were probably the earliest chemical experiments. He would notice that the presence of saltpeter made the fire burn brighter, and its use as a tinder maker would suggest itself by mixing it with some substance which he knew to be combustible. The most common fuel he knew of was wood, but it must be a powder to mix evenly with saltpeter. Wood is not easily reduced to powder. Saws had not been invented, so that he could not add sawdust, and the nearest thing he could get would be charcoal from the fire, which could easily be reduced to powder. With this mixture, he would be well on the way to success in elementary pyrotechny. The next step in his career as the first pyrotechnist is to utilize his composition as an easy means of making fire. Gradually, he gives up his hitherto necessary tasks of hunting and trapping as he receives the fruits of other labors in return for his services as fire maker to the tribe. The most important item in early social life is fire, the implements for producing it, the most valued property of the tribe. It was the focus of religion and the center of daily existence so that any new phenomenon connected with fire would be of the greatest interest to primitive people, and any shortcut to the production of fire would be accorded more perseverance and care in its perfection than almost any other invention. Fire would be struck with a piece of iron pyrites on a flint. Small pieces of regulene particles of iron would be detached, and fall on the fire mixture unlit. Afterwards, when combustion of the mass of fire mixture took place, these small pieces of metal would scintillate, as do the iron filings in a modern firework composition. This would give rise to a further series of experiments, and gradually the composition known as Chinese fire would be evolved which is known to have been in use in the East from remote times. Having arrived at a pyrotechnic composition, attempt to use it in other ways besides fire-making would naturally follow. And sooner or later, the idea of filling the mixture into tubes would suggest itself, especially as both in India and China in one of which countries pyrotechny undoubtedly originated, a serviceable tube, or to use the modern term, case, was ready to hand, in any size or quantity, in the ubiquitous bamboo. The bamboo is in use for this purpose at the present day in the East, and until recent times, when displaced by European weapons, was used in the construction of ordnance of considerable size. Mortars used for throwing firework shell up to six or more inches in diameter are still in use in Japan and China, the barrel consisting of a section of bamboo strengthened on the outside with a binding of split cane. Having reached the point of charging composition into a tube, that is to say, confining it, a more or less violent explosion was likely, or rather certain to follow, during the course of the experiments, which might suggest the use of a tube as a means of discharging a projectile. This would lead to research in the direction of the best composition for that purpose, and the evolution of gunpowder. It must be remembered that the constituents of gunpowder must be present in approximately exact proportion, whereas with primitive pyrotechnic compositions, if the ingredients saltpeter and charcoal are present, it is almost impossible to fail in getting some result. 
The above suggestion must not be taken literally as a statement of fact, but rather as an attempt on the part of the writer to trace the stages by which pyrotechnic and explosive compositions came to be evolved. If one disabuses one's mind of the curiously widespread belief that all fireworks are composed chiefly of gunpowder, and that without the invention of gunpowder, fireworks could not have been constructed, it seems far more likely that pyrotechny is based on the discovery of the assistance given to combustion by saltpeter than on the discovery of gunpowder. Chapter 2. Pyrotechny in the East Pyrotechny undoubtedly had its genesis in the East, and for that reason we will deal with its development there first. As he has intended to convey, the writer is strongly of opinion that the discovery of pyrotechnic compositions antedated that of gunpowder. In many cases, earlier writers have discovered passages which they consider proved the use of firearms and gunpowder. In reality, these refer to Greek fire and similar compositions, which were used as projectiles, being thrown from machines or catapults, and not as propellants. Gunpowder as a mixture of ingredients may have been known from remote times, as undoubtedly were other simple pyrotechnic compositions, but all evidence goes to show that its use as a propellant was not known until well into the Christian era. The composition Greek fire, known in ancient times as naphtha, was a mixture of pitch, resin, and sulfur, with the addition in some cases of crude saltpeter. It may be considered that in the absence of the latter ingredient, the mixture does not constitute a pyrotechnic composition. But from the description of the use of naphtha in early writings, it appears at least likely that it was generally present. The fire was either enclosed in hollow stones or iron vessels and thrown from a catapult, or sometimes filled into the end of arrows and assisted to propel them forward or sustain their flight. Philostratus, 170 to 250 AD, writing of the Indian campaign of Alexander the Great, BC 326, relates that the inhabitants of a town on the river Hyphasis, or Baeus, defended themselves by means of lightning and thunder, which darted upon their besiegers. This has been considered as evidence of the use of firearms, but is more probably the first reference to Greek fire. Greek fire, or naphtha, was used at the defense of Constantinople between 660 and 667. At the siege of Pyong King Luoyang in 1232, as mentioned in the Chinese annals, iron pots were thrown containing a burning substance which could spread fire over half an acre, and described by the historians as the thunder which shakes heaven. The Mongolians attacking Baghdad in the year 1258 made use of similar vessels, also fire arrows. Marco Polo, describing sieges of towns in China, 1268 to 1273, mentions the throwing of fire. In most of the early records, although noise is remarked upon, it is apparently while the projectile is in the air or upon impact. This disposes of the impression, which many writers have formed, that firearms are referred to, there being no reference to an initial explosion. Sir George Stanton, writing in 1798 of his embassy to the Emperor of China, says that nitre, or saltpeter, is the daily produce of China and India, and there, accordingly, the knowledge of gunpowder seems coeval 
with that of the most distant historic events. Among the Chinese, it has been applied at all times to useful purposes and to amusement in making a vast variety of fireworks. But its force had not been directed through strong metallic tubes as it was by Europeans soon after they had discovered that composition. Although the place of origin of the art, pyrotechny has not developed in the East as rapidly as in Europe, except in Japan. Japanese pyrotechnists, with that wonderful capacity for careful and exact manual work which is so characteristic of the race, have developed aerial fireworks to a remarkable degree of perfection. The compositions used are not to be compared with European manufactures in point of color or brilliance, but the effects obtained are extraordinary. The stars upon the bursting of the shell are thrown out in symmetrical patterns and designs, several examples of which are given in the accompanying Japanese color prints. Daylight fireworks also originated in Japan. Instead of pyrotechnic effects, the shell contains a grotesque balloon in the form of an animal, human figure, or other form, which being open and weighted at the lower end, becomes inflated as it falls and remains in the air for a considerable period. Other daylight effects are colored clouds formed by colored powder, distributed by the bursting of the shell, showers of streamers, confetti, and toys. Chinese firework displays have often been enthusiastically described by travelers in China. Whether it is that the glamour of the East distorts the perceptions or that these travelers have not seen a European firework display, there is no doubt that such descriptions are, to say the least, overcolored. Chinese fire, a composition of saltpeter, iron filings, sulfur, and charcoal, a few simple color compositions, and a large number of Chinese crackers of varying sizes constitute a Chinese display the rest of the exhibition being eked out with lanterns, pictures, etc., which certainly do not come under the heading of pyrotechnics. The writer once had an opportunity of witnessing a Chinese display of some importance, lasting several hours, which produced the effect on the mind of watching some performance or game, of the rules of which one was in entire ignorance. Pyrotechnically, only the crudest effects were produced, the remainder of the display consisting of such items as a man slowly climbing a ladder carrying a lantern was to the uninitiated mystifying. The following is an account by a traveler in the early 19th century of a Chinese display. The fireworks in some particulars, says he, exceeded anything of the kind I had ever seen in grandeur, magnificence, and variety. They were, I own, inferior to the Chinese fireworks we had seen at Batavia, but infinitely superior in point of novelty, neatness, and ingenuity of contrivance. One piece of machinery I greatly admired. A green chest, five feet square, was hoisted up by a pulley 50 or 60 feet from the ground, the bottom of which was so contrived as then suddenly to fall out and make way for 20 or 30 strings of lanterns enclosed in a box to descend from it, unfolding themselves from one another by degrees, so at last to form a collection of full 500 each having a light of a beautifully colored flame burning brightly within it. This devolution and development of lanterns was several times repeated, and at every time exhibiting a difference of color and figure. On each side was a correspondence of smaller boxes, 
which opened in like manner as the other, and let down an immense network of fire, with divisions and compartments of various forms and dimensions, round and square, hexagons, octagons, etc., which shone like the brightest burnished copper, and flashed like prismatic lightnings with every impulse of the wind. The whole concluded with a volcano, or general explosion and discharge of suns and stars, squibs, crackers, rockets and grenades, which involved the gardens for an hour in a cloud of intolerable smoke. The diversity of color with which the Chinese have the secret of clothing their fire seems one of the chief merits of their pyrotechny. It will be seen that lanterns play an important part in the exhibition, and that when the fireworks proper are reached, the result is an intolerable smoke. In India, as in China, fireworks play a frequent part in religious and civil ceremonies. In the former country, at certain festivals, a primitive device for producing a series of reports is used. These are called adervetis and consist of a series of short iron tubes fitted to a wooden plank, charged with gunpowder and tamped with clay. At weddings, crackers are largely used under a variety of names, such as Vengagvedi, Gola, Pataka, or Karu. Today, these are simple crackers, filled with country-made gunpowder, or the imported Chinese crackers. Formerly, almost the only composition used was chlorate of potash, and one of the sulfides of arsenic. A favorite form consisted of a small quantity of the two ingredients, put together unmixed into a piece of rag, with some small stones or grit and tied. The resulting fireworks were similar to the throw-down crackers sold in this country. Owing to the very large number of accidents caused by the casual methods, both in manufacture and use, with this highly sensitive composition, H.M. Chief Inspector of Explosives for India endeavored in 1902 to secure its prohibition, as was done in this country in 1895. But it was not until 1910, when it had been established that this composition was being used by anarchists, that it was finally prohibited. The most successful effect produced by Hindu pyrotechnists is the tubri. The composition is here known as Chinese fire, a mixture of charcoal, saltpeter, sulfur, and iron dust, charged into either bamboo tubes or earthen pots. It is a common practice to fix a pot at either end of a long bamboo, which is whirled quickly about by a performer. The result produced is quite good but seems rather to come under the heading of juggling than that of pyrotechnics proper. As the pots are theoretically the wrong shape for such a purpose, that is to say, a large mass of composition is burning through a narrow orifice, premature explosions are frequent. This want of theoretical knowledge is noticeable throughout, but such incidents seem to be appreciated as part of the show. Another use of the earth pot is the barusu, a kind of red flare, the composition used being sulfur, saltpeter, and nitrate of strontia. Flare compositions are also used loose as in England, and are known as chandrajota, or mateb. Abu Savanani, or Hawaii, that is to say, rockets, are now made similarly to those manufactured in Europe, except a bamboo case is most generally used. But formerly, chlorate of potash and orpiment seem to have been employed for this purpose. 
The firework shell under the name Oot is also manufactured very much as in this country, except that the range of effects is very limited, simple colored stars being almost the only garniture used. In Siam, it is a custom, and one apparently of considerable antiquity, to celebrate certain religious festivals with firework displays. These displays take place in the daytime and take the form of discharges of rockets, some of which are of very large size, a writer giving their length exclusive of the stick as from 8 to 10 feet. The case is composed of a section of bamboo bound with string. The composition consists of coarse native powder, of which from 20 pounds to 30 pounds is often used in one case. The rocket stick, which is of bamboo, varying from 20 feet to 40 feet in length, is gaily decorated with colored paper and tinsel and fitted with bamboo whistles. A rough scaffold is erected from which to fire the rockets. And according to those who have witnessed such exhibitions, considerable altitudes are reached by the rockets in flight. As may be expected with such crude methods, mishaps are of frequent occurrence. Chapter 3 Pyrotechny in Europe Pyrotechnic compositions and gunpowder are inextricably mixed together in early European records. For our inquiries, it will serve no useful purpose to disentangle them, the latter being only a particular case of the former. We will therefore deal with them together, taking the evidence of the knowledge of one as that of both, as until gunpowder is specifically mentioned, as being used as a propellant in a gun or similar weapon, there is nothing to distinguish it from any other pyrotechnic composition. The earliest record of European pyrotechny is in Claudius's account of the public festivities during the consulate of Theodosius in the 4th century AD, in which he describes fire, which ran about in different directions over the planks, without burning or even charring them, and which formed by their twisting and turning globes of fire. Leo VI, Emperor of the East, in a work written about A.D. 900, says, We have diverse ways of destroying the enemy's ships, as by means of fire prepared in tubes, from which they issue with a sound of thunder and with a fiery smoke, that burns the vessels on which they are hurled. A tube of tin must be put on the front of the ship to hurl this from. The most interesting reference of an early date is supposed to have been written by Marcus Grecus in his Liber Ignium at Comberendos Hostis, the Book of Fires for Burning Up the Enemy, in which he not only gives the exact proportions of the compositions, but describes what is virtually the modern cracker and also a primitive form of rocket. The case of the former was only partially filled, as with the jumping cracker of today, and although the wording is not very explicit, it was apparently bent in a similar way. The date of this work is a subject of controversy. Some writers place it as early as the 8th century, and it can only be said with certainty that it is not later than 1280. The latter date is fixed by the death of Albertus Magnus, who in his book De Mirabilibus Mundi, from internal evidence, is obviously plagiarizing the Liber Ignium. Friar Roger Bacon, 1214-1294, in two of his works, refers at least twice to compositions containing saltpeter, powdered charcoal, and sulfur. In one place he refers to fires that shall burn at what distance we please, in another to thunder and coruscations, which references seem to suggest 
that he is describing something of a pyrotechnic nature rather than the simple effect of gunpowder. His description in no way indicates that he claimed to be the inventor, but rather as something well known before. Dr. Jeb, in his preface to Bacon's Opus Magus, refers to what seems to be an early example of both the rocket and the cracker. Dutton's, in his Inquiries into the Origin of the Discoveries Attributed to the Moderns, 1790, makes reference to many early writers, which are mostly so vague and exaggerated that no definite conclusion can be drawn from them. Most refer to the early uses of Greek fire or similar composition. Don Pedro, Bishop of Leon, says that in 1343, in a sea combat between the King of Tunis and the Moorish King of Seville, those of Tunis had certain iron tubes or barrels wherewith they threw thunderbolts of fire. This description, if accurate, may be thought to suggest the use of cannons, but it is more likely to refer to the use of Greek fire. This composition will, in certain proportions, if charged into a strong tube, give intermittent bursts, projecting blazing masses of the mixture to a considerable distance. The writer has seen this effect produced in a steel mortar of five and one-half inches diameter, the masses of composition being thrown a distance of upwards of a hundred yards, a considerable range, in the days of close warfare. Anyone who has seen this phenomenon will at once realize that here probably is the true solution of many obscure early references to explain which so much ingenuity has been expended. An interesting fact which seems to have escaped the notice of writers on this subject is that Teresa, daughter of Alfonso V, King of Leon and the Asturias, A.D. 999, when married to Abdallah, King of Toledo, took for device on her coat of arms a mortar in which a powder is being pounded. This powder is supposed to represent gunpowder, a supposition which is supported by the motto Minima Maxima Fecit, a little makes much. If gunpowder is intended, this must be one of the earliest references to its quality of exploding, and it is difficult to explain the meaning otherwise. Richard Coeur de Lyon used Greek fire on his galley at the Siege of Acre in 1191, and it is thought by many that it was introduced into Western Europe by the Crusaders, who had learned its use in the East. Alfonso, Duke of Ferrara, had as his coat of arms a bombshell in flight, and Antoine de la Lange, Count of Hustraten, had a bombshell exploding in water. The adoption of these two devices at about the same time, 1540, seems to indicate that this projectile was coming into use, that is to say, for military purposes at least. An early reference to Shell appears in Stowe's Chronicles, 1565. He mentions two foreigners, Peter Brand and Peter von Cullen, a gunsmith, in the employ of Henry VIII, around A.D. 1546, who caused to be made certain mortar pieces, being at the mouth 11 inches and to 19 inches wide, for the use whereof to be made certain hollow shot of cast iron, to be stuffed with firework or wildfire, whereof the bigger sort for the same had screws of iron to receive a match, to carry fire kindled, that the firework might be set on fire for to break in pieces the same hollow shot, whereof the smallest piece hitting any man would kill or spoil him. The missile is, to all intents, the firework shell of the present day, except that the modern shell 
has a paper mache case. The reference to firework, without further explanation, seems to indicate that by this time, the word was well established in use. Shakespeare makes three references to fireworks. In Love's Labor's Lost, Act 5, Scene 1, Don Armado says, The king would have me present the princess with some delightful entertainment, or show, or pageant, or antic, or firework. In Henry VIII, Act 1, Scene 3, we read of fights and fireworks. And again, in King John, Act 2, Scene 1, what cracker is this same that deafs our ears? However, nothing in the nature of a firework display appears to have taken place, at least in this country, before the time of Elizabeth. The use of fire for theatrical purposes, as in mystery plays to represent the gate of hell, has been taken by some to refer to fireworks. But this seems doubtful as flames are mentioned, and it is more probable that a torch or similar contrivance was used. When, however, we read a description of a barge at the coronation of Anne Boleyn in 1538, carrying a dragon casting forth wildfire and men casting fire, the reference to some pyrotechnic effect, however primitive, seems fairly obvious. The men performers may be considered as early types of the green man, who made his appearance somewhat later. The office of this performer was to head processions, carrying fire clubs and scattering fireworks, probably sparks, to clear the way. One account of a procession to the Chester races on St. George's Day, 1610, commences as follows. Two men in green ivy, set with work upon their other habit, with black hair and black beards, very ugly to behold, and garlands upon their heads, with great clubs in their hands, with fireworks, to scatter abroad to maintain the way for the rest of the show. The fire clubs referred to are described in John Bates's book, published in 1635. The same writer illustrates a green man on the title page of his work. Regarding the origin of the green man, it has been suggested that the character was evolved from the wild men, satyrs, monsters, etc., which appeared in the earlier exhibitions. This may or may not be so, but another explanation suggested to the writer by an old Danish print of the 16th century is at least plausible. This print, which apparently represents a floating firework device of the old scenic type, shows two figures carrying fire clubs wearing leaves and suggesting immediately the green man of a slightly later date. Behind them are two figures holding rockets, leaving no doubt that a firework display is portrayed. On the other hand, apart from the fact that normally they have no fire issuing from their clubs, the supporters of the Danish royal arms might be here depicted a supposition which is borne out by the fact that the figure surmounting the erection carries the crown and scepter of Denmark. It seems quite within the bounds of possibility that these two figures were introduced into Danish displays as a complement to royalty, and that later they appeared in England and became, as it were, acclimatized. Color is lent to this belief by the record of a display given on a float by the King of Denmark in 1606 upon his departure from this country, where he had been on a visit to his brother-in-law, James I. This exhibition seems to have given James a taste for fireworks, and one at least of the Danish artists appears to have remained in this country, 
as some months after, James had a display carried out by a Dane, two Dutchmen, and Sir Thomas Chaloner. In 1572, a firework display was given in the Temple Fields, Warwick, by the Earl of Warwick, then Master General of the Ordnance. The occasion was a visit to the castle by Queen Elizabeth, who appears to have been rather partial to such exhibitions. The display consisted of a mimic battle with two canvas forts for a setting. Noise was provided by the discharge of ordnance of various sizes. The fireworks proper seemed to have taken the form of flights of rockets. The display was evidently conducted in a somewhat reckless manner, some houses being set on fire, and some completely destroyed, the two inhabitants of which are said in a contemporary report to have been in bed and asleep, although how they could be with the continuous discharge from twenty pieces of ordnance, to say nothing of qualivers and harquebuses in the immediate neighborhood, is to say the least curious. Two other displays attended by Elizabeth were those at Kenilworth in 1572 and at Elvetham in 1591. The first European people to make headway in the art of pyrotechny proper appear to have been the Italians. Venocchio, an Italian, in a work on artillery dated 1572, attributes to the Florentines and Viennese the honor of being the first who made fireworks on erections of wood, decorated with statues and pictures, raised to a great height, some in Florence being 40 ells or 72 feet high. He adds that these were illuminated so that they might be seen from a distance, and that the statues threw out fire from their mouths and eyes. He refers to the practice, which survived up to the end of the 18th century, of constructing elaborate temples or palaces, richly decorated, with transparencies illuminated from inside, statuary, gilding, floral, and other decorations. On these erections the fireworks proper were displayed, and which were then called artificial fireworks. Nothing very large in the way of fireworks set pieces seems to have been attempted, but effect was gained by repetition of a small device over the façade of the building. Displays were given annually in Florence at the Feast of St. John and the Assumption. This custom extended to Rome, where the festivals were given on the Feast of St. Peter and St. Paul, and at the rejoicings on the election of a Pope. The towers and fortifications of the Castle of St. Angelo furnish suitable spots for these, being visible from the greater part of the city of Rome, and what are described as braziers, fire pots, and other fires would be placed there, so as to give a great display without the expense of a building. Evelyn, the famous diarist, gives an account of one such display, which he witnessed in 1664. In other towns that wished to imitate the festival of Rome, it was arranged to place illuminations on the highest towers and steeples of the town, but as it was found that there was considerable danger of fire from these, it was afterwards preferred to make suitable erections in the great public squares, which were convenient for the exhibition itself and also for the sightseers. The Italians appear to have held the supremacy until the end of the 17th century. In the Book of Artillery by Diego Ufano, written in 1610, we read that only very simple fireworks were made in this time in Spain and Flanders, consisting of wooden framework supporting pots of fire, wrapped round with cloth dipped in pitch, but that more than fifty years before, magnificent spectacles could be seen in Italy. 
in 1615 on the occasion of the marriage of Louis XIII. A display was given at Paris in the Place Royale, in which were included combats between men carrying illuminated arms. In 1606, the Duc de Sully gave a spectacle which depicted a battle between savages and monsters, the former throwing darts and fire. A similar display had previously been given on the occasion of the entry of Henry II into Rheims, and it was repeated in 1612. These spectacles, which are quoted as firework displays, cannot rightly be considered as such, fireworks playing a comparatively secondary part in the exhibitions. A display of this nature to celebrate the capture of Rochelle was conducted by Clariner of Nuremberg, a celebrated pyrotechnist of the day. During the reign of Louis XIV, 1638 to 1715, great advances were made in pyrotechny in France. Great displays were given on the return of the king and queen to Paris in 1660, on five consecutive days at Versailles in 1676, also on the occasion of the birth of the Dauphin in 1682, in Paris at the Louvre, Dijon, and Lyon. A particularly fine display in celebration of the Peace of Ryswick, 1669, for which event displays took place in several countries, is mentioned by Frézier, who wrote a treatise on pyrotechny in 1747. It was, he says, witnessing this display that inspired him to study the art. One of the chief causes of progress in France was the encouragement given by Louis XV, 1710 to 1774, to the pyrotechnist Morel Torre and the Ruggieri brothers the latter being Italians from Bologna, who became naturalized Frenchmen, and contributed very greatly to the development of French pyrotechny. They were the first to rely chiefly on fireworks for the effect, instead of using them merely to embellish a scenic or architectural structure. Louis XV expanded large sums of money on displays, one of the finest being that fired at Versailles in 1739 by Ruggieri on the occasion of the marriage of Madame la Première of France with Don Philippe of Spain. Writing of this display in 1821, Ruggieri's son says, There appeared for the first time the Salamander la Rosas and the Guilloche which are still admired today. These are purely pyrotechnic pieces and devices. Similar or identical ones are used at the present day, which seems to indicate that fireworks proper were making headway against scenic effect. Other displays in France during the 18th century were those on the occasions of the birth of the Duke of Brittany, 1704. Birth of the Dauphin, 1730. The Convalescence of the King, 1744. And the Return of the King to Paris, 1745. Also, there is in existence a series of prints which, but for the fact that they are described as fireworks, would be taken to be scenic tableau. Whether the figures are human beings or waxworks is not indicated. These were erected in celebration of the following events. The taking of Tournay. The taking of Chateau Grand. Victory over the Allies. All dated 1745. The taking of Ypres. 1747. All of which took place in Paris before the Hotel de Ville. Similar displays were given in Lyon in 1765 to celebrate the taking of Fort Saint-Philippe and at Soleure in 1777 in honor of the Swiss Guard. 
displays took place at Versailles, 1751, on the occasion of the birth of the Duke of Burgundy. In 1758-59 came a further series of victory celebrations in honor of the victory at Lutzelburg over the English in America and over the Allies at Bergeri, all of which appear to have been of the tableau type mentioned above. There were also displays for the peace celebrations on the Seine, 1763, the birth of the Dauphin, 1782, in the Place de Genève, and peace rejoicings, 1783, before the Hotel de Ville. Ruggieri, however, states in his book that the display fired on the marriage of Louis XVI, or as he then was, the Dauphin, was the only display since the Great Fets of 1739 which showed any considerable advance in the art. He may, however, be in some degree biased, as his father was concerned in each of these displays. And with that conclusion to Chapter 3, I think we'll end this evening's reading from Pyrotechnics, The History and Art of Firework Making. If you're at all interested in this topic, let me encourage you to find this book at Project Gutenberg, a link for which you'll find in the show description. It includes a number of colored plates of Japanese fireworks, and they're quite beautiful. I think you'll enjoy them. If you'd like to connect, suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, or request more from one we've already started, you can drop me an email via our website, www.boringbookspod.com. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night.